U.S. Agriculture Secretary met Governor Abbott today to announce steps to battle an invasive species that could threaten Texas livestock. A secret government lab, millions of tiny bioengineered assassins. A 30-year war against a foreign invader that bleeds the country of billions. This is the incredible true story of the fight against the fire ant. To stop them, scientists found their natural enemy from South America, a fly that creates zombie ants and then removes their heads from the inside out. They dropped millions of these flies across the southern states, hoping to end the invasion once and for all. What happened next was a lesson in just how stubborn and strange nature can be. An army from below. It all started quietly a hidden passenger on a cargo ship sailing from South America in the 1930s. No one saw it coming. Docking in the port of Mobile, Alabama, this unwelcome guest wasn't a person or a crate of goods. It was a tiny stowaway with a powerful sting and a relentless drive to conquer. The red imported fire ant had arrived in America. And for the next several decades, it would wage a silent, devastating war on the nation. The thing nobody tells you is how quickly a small problem can become a full-blown catastrophe. You see, the southern United States was a paradise for these ants. The weather was perfect, there was plenty of food, and most importantly, their natural enemies were thousands of miles away, back in their native Brazil and Argentina. Without anything to keep them in check, the fire ant population exploded. They weren't just a nuisance, they were a destructive force of nature. Many people are crazy about keeping their lawns perfect, but these ants turned pristine backyards into minefields of earthen mounds, some several feet wide. Each mound was the tip of an iceberg, the entrance to a massive underground city housing hundreds of thousands of aggressive soldiers. The ants themselves were brutal. Their scientific name, Solenopsis Invicta, literally means the invincible. And they lived up to it. They didn't just bite, they latched on with powerful jaws and then swiveled their bodies, stinging multiple times in a circle. Each sting injected a dose of venom that felt like a hot needle piercing the skin, a burning pain that gave them their fiery name. For most people, it was a painful annoyance. But for small animals or people with allergies, it could be far worse. Believe it or not, these tiny invaders began to have a huge impact on the economy. Farmers were hit the hardest, the ants swarmed and took down newborn livestock, especially calves. They would target the soft tissues, the eyes, and the nose, leaving a horrifying scene for farmers to find in the morning. They damaged crops, chewed through electrical wiring, and their hard mounds broke expensive farm equipment. By the 1990s, fire ants had spread across more than 346 million acres of American land. That's an area bigger than the entire state of Texas. The cost of the damage and control efforts soared into the billions of dollars every single year. People tried everything to fight back. They poured gasoline on the mounds and set them on fire. They flooded them with water. They used every kind of bug spray and poison they could find. But the ants were always one step ahead. It turns out they are brilliant engineers of survival. When their mounds were flooded, the entire colony would cling together forming a living raft of ant bodies with the precious queen safe in the middle. They would just float on the water until they reached dry land, ready to build a new city. Their resilience was astounding, and it was clear that conventional weapons were not going to win this war. Desperate times called for a desperate and truly bizarre solution. Scientists had an idea. What if the answer wasn't a new chemical, but something alive? Nature's perfect parasite. To defeat the fire ant, scientists had to think like the fire ant. Where did it come from? And more importantly, what was it afraid of back home? Researchers traveled to the floodplains of South America, the ant's native turf, to find their natural enemy. They observed for months, and what they found was both tiny and terrifying. It was a creature straight out of a horror film, a species of fly from the Foridae family, so small it looked like a gnat. But this was no ordinary fly. This was the ant's boogeyman, a creature that would soon be known by a much more fitting name, the decapitating fly. But not all things are what they seem. This fly didn't attack with jaws or a stinger. 
Its method was far more sinister, a masterpiece of biological warfare that had been perfected over millions of years. The female fly is a master of aerial acrobatics. She can hover over a panicked fire ant and in a split second, dive down and use a needle-like appendage, called an ovipositor, to inject a single microscopic egg into the ant's body. The ant barely feels it. The whole encounter is over in less than a second. The ant goes back to its work, seemingly unharmed, but it is already doomed. It is now a walking incubator for its own executioner. Here's where it gets truly wild. A few days later, the egg hatches inside the ant. The tiny larva, or maggot, doesn't just sit there. It begins a slow, deliberate journey through the ant's body, heading for the ultimate prize, the head. Once it arrives, it settles in and starts to feast on the ant's brain tissue and the muscles that control its jaws. Incredibly, the ant is still alive during this process. It keeps walking, foraging, and interacting with its nestmates, all while its mind is slowly being devoured from the inside. It has been turned into a zombie, a puppet controlled by the parasite growing within. For about two weeks, the zombie ant wanders aimlessly. Then, the fly larva makes its final move. It releases a special chemical, an enzyme that dissolves the connective tissues in the ant's neck. The ant's head, now just an empty shell, simply falls off. The great mystery of nature is how a creature so small can perform such a complex and gruesome task. But the show isn't over. The larva, safe inside the severed head capsule, continues to grow. It pupates, transforming from a maggot into an adult fly. About two weeks later, a brand new, fully formed, decapitating fly pushes its way out of the ant's mouth, ready to continue the horrifying cycle. The most important detail for the scientists was the fly's laser-like focus. It only targeted fire ants. It ignored all other native ant species, other insects, and animals. This made it the perfect biological weapon. It was a guided missile designed by nature for a single target. The plan was no longer just a theory. It was time to build an army of these tiny assassins and unleash them on American soil. A 30-year-long gamble was about to begin, and nobody knew how it would end. A 30-year gamble. The year was 1997. In a nondescript building in Gainesville, Florida, a top-secret project was underway. The United States Department of Agriculture had established a special laboratory, a factory for creating life. But they weren't building robots or machines. They were breeding millions upon millions of decapitating flies. This was the nerve center for a 30-year operation, a massive biological experiment designed to turn the tide in the war against fire ants. You see, the government was ready to bet big on this tiny creature. Breeding these flies was a delicate and ingenious process. Scientists had to recreate the exact conditions that triggered the fly's hunting instinct. They built what they called attack chambers. Inside, they kept large colonies of fire ants. To get the flies interested, the scientists would constantly disturb the ants, poking and prodding their nests. This sent the ants into a frenzy, causing them to release alarm pheromones, a chemical signal that screamed danger. To the decapitating flies, this scent was like a dinner bell. Freshly hatched flies were released into the chambers for three to four days, giving them plenty of time to find hosts and inject their deadly eggs. Once the ants were infected, the real waiting game began. The scientists would carefully collect the zombie ants and place them in special containers. They had to wait for that gruesome moment when the heads would fall off. These severed heads were the real prize. Each one was a tiny incubator holding a future soldier. The heads were collected and stored until the new flies emerged. At the start, the lab was producing about 1,500 flies a day, but as the program ramped up over the decades, that number grew exponentially, allowing them to launch attacks across multiple states. The deployment missions were like something out of a military operation. Researchers would load the flies into plastic tubes with 300 to 400 flies packed into each one. They would then drive out to heavily infested areas, find a large fire ant mound, and prepare for battle. The first step was to create chaos. Using shovels and sticks, they would violently disturb the mound, forcing the terrified ants to pour out and defend their home. 
As the ground writhed with a carpet of red, the scientists would pop open the tubes. Hundreds, sometimes tens of thousands of decapitating flies would burst out, diving into the panicked swarm and beginning the cycle of infection all over again. They even developed a Trojan horse strategy. In some cases, they would release a few infected ants back near their colony. These ants, acting normally for a while, would walk right back into the heart of the enemy's fortress, carrying the seeds of its destruction within them. It was a clever and insidious tactic, but the entire operation was a high-wire act. The missions required perfect timing. The weather had to be just right, not too windy, not too cold. The flies had to be healthy and at the peak of their reproductive age. It was a complex, 30-year-long effort of breeding, transporting, and releasing a living weapon. The flies were now out there, and for the first time, the fire ants faced a real threat. A war with no winner. For three decades, millions of flies were dropped on millions of ants. The results at first seemed revolutionary. The thing nobody expected was that the biggest impact wasn't the number of ants eliminated, but the sheer terror the flies created. The fire ants, once the fearless bullies of the insect world, became cautious and paranoid. Entire colonies were seen abandoning food sources and freezing their foraging operations at the slightest buzz of a fly. The psychological impact was huge. The flies had established a kingdom of fear, and the flies weren't just surviving, they were thriving. They established permanent, self-sustaining populations across the South. It was a massive success. In many areas, the flies had naturally spread to cover between 50% and 90% of fire ant territory. Studies showed a direct impact on the ant workforce. In areas with established fly populations, there was a 10 to 15% reduction in the number of worker ants. This hampered the colony's ability to gather food and expand, slowing their conquest. For a while, it looked like humanity, with its tiny fly ally, was finally winning. But then, something unexpected happened. The ants started to adapt. Believe it or not, these insects began to change their behavior to survive. They learned to forage at different times of the day when the flies were less active. They became better at spotting the flies, and colonies started to avoid areas with high fly populations altogether. The fire ants were losing battles, but they were learning from them. They were evolving right before the scientists' eyes. The war had entered a new phase, an evolutionary arms race, and the ants had one ultimate weapon that the flies could never overcome, their staggering reproductive power. You see, taking out 15% of the workers was a blow, but it wasn't a fatal one. A healthy fire ant colony can have multiple queens, and a single queen can lay thousands of eggs a day. Several times a year, on a warm day after a rain, the colonies release millions of new winged queens into the sky. These queens fly off, find a mate, and start brand new colonies. They could rebuild their populations far faster than the flies could tear them down. So, after 30 years, after all the resources and scientific brain power, what was the final result? Here is the most shocking truth of all. The fire ants won they still control over 346 million acres of American land, the same amount, if not more, than when the program began. Did we solve the ant problem or just create a new, more complicated one? Let us know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more incredible stories.